Hello everybody and welcome to this session of Activate Live. Over the next 30 minutes I'm hoping to share with you um, what I believe are the essential strategic pillars for building an iconic 21st century brand. Now I'm Jonathan Mildenhall and I'm the co-founder and chief exec of a brand consultancy here in San Francisco with an office in London called 21st Century Brand. Now, a little bit about 21st Century Brand before we get into the meat of this session. My co-founder, Neil Barry, and I set up 21st Century Brand in May 2018 with a very, very focused mission. And that mission is to help founders, chief execs, and CMOs build the most influential brands of our time. Now, who have we done that with? Well, we feel very fortunate that in just the last two years, we can call Pinterest, Peloton, Uber, Nextdoor, Mars, N26 in Europe, uh, key clients. And even though they all operate in different categories, they all have one thing in common. And that's that all of these companies are led by leaders who want to build category defining brands. And it's when you're a category defining brand that you can become the most influential brand of our time. So let's just take a little look at what we mean by building an influential brand. We've identified that there are four key strategic characteristics of brands of influential significance today. Now, this identification has come from the brands that we've helped build on the inside out, the brands that we have consulted on from the outside, and also a huge amount of research that we've done into anticipating where the needs and expectations of communities and consumers are heading all over the world. Our model is very simple. Essentially, brands built today that stand for significant meaning and earn a disproportionate share of market have four common pillars in place. The first pillar is being purpose-led. Does the organization have an outstanding purpose that transcends that of the business plan, but it's not so lofty that it actually leads to a disconnection of the business plan? Secondly, is the company set up to unlock the creativity and the advocacy of the community. So are they community driven? The third strategic pillar is about being tech enabled. This is not just about building the basic product through the lens of human technology, but also are you using cutting edge technology to engage with different customers um, across the board and throughout marketing? And are you using technology to help manage the life cycle of each customer? And then the fourth pillar is, are you narrative based? Do you have an understanding of what it takes to build a world-class storytelling engine that unifies the needs of all of your stakeholders? Everyone from investors to employees to the end customer. So I'm now going to unpack each one of these pillars. And in so doing, I'm going to take this opportunity to share with you what I believe is best in class as an example. But also we're going to take a look at brands that have stumbled and occasionally get it wrong so that we can learn from those mistakes of others, as well as learning from best in class examples. So, looking at really where I come from and my credibility in this space, after years at Coca-Cola, I joined Airbnb in 2014. 
And it was through the application of these four strategic pillars that we were able to help Airbnb grow from a reputation as a really cool property rental platform to arguably the most influential travel brand on the planet. Let's just take a look at a couple of stats from Airbnb in 2014, because it was relatively small compared to what it is today. In 2014, Airbnb only had 400,000 homes on the platform. There were only 36 million guest, unique guest bookings in 2014 and 18 million unique guests. The valuation of the company at the beginning of 2014 was just a billion dollars. And my total marketing budget that included performance marketing, PR, experiential, brand marketing, and policy marketing, my total global budget was just $25 million. Now, that was significant for me because I was leaving my job as SVP of marketing at Coca-Cola North America, where I presided over a $1.2 billion annual marketing budget. So I would spend in a year at Coca-Cola more than the total value of Airbnb when I joined Airbnb. So I knew that I had to develop a different playbook to make sure that my $25 million worked harder than any $25 million that I'd ever had the privilege of presiding over in my career. So deep diving into purpose-led. All you have to do to really understand the power of purpose is to spend 30 minutes on Google searching why do purpose-driven companies outperform those of their competitors. And you will find that there are hundreds of media articles, dozens of academic theses, and lots and lots of different business cases that will unpack the power of purpose-driven companies. But I always like to just dwell for a moment on this quote from Peter Frisk, because it really does summarize why you should really be thinking about building an unquestionable purpose on top of your business plan. He writes, why purpose-driven companies do better? They are more ambitious. They attract greater talent. They inspire the right kind of innovation. They make faster business decisions. They're more trusted. They increase loyalty and they find it easier to attract investment. So the power of purpose is pretty undeniable. Now, the good news is that the Business Roundtable here in the United States, which is a group of 181 of the most powerful chief executives in North America came together in August 2019 to redefine the purpose of an American corporation. Because prior to this initiative, the purpose of an American corporation was steadfastly focused on solely maximizing shareholder return. But as they started to really appreciate the responsibility that corporates have for our society at large, the Business Roundtable expanded the definition of a corporation here in the US by introducing four strategic mandates. Strategic mandate number one, deliver value to our customers. Yes, that makes sense. Strategic value number two, invest in growing and developing our employees. Strategic mandate number three, deal fairly and ethically with our suppliers. And finally, support the communities within which we work. So we now have an expanded definition for the role that a corporation plays here in the United States. So who does purpose-driven marketing well? well? I hope you'll forgive me, but I actually want to take a trip for me down memory lane and actually talk about America the Beautiful 
the last piece of work that I worked on whilst I was at Coca-Cola. In 2014, America was gripped by an intensity of race relations that we hadn't seen for a long time. Police, police brutality, racism, institutional racism were, at that time in 2014, and I know we're all suffering because it's erupted once again in ways that, were even, that are even more devastating than in 2014. But in 2014, we decided, the leadership at the Coca-Cola company, that we were going to take our marketing budget and invest it in Super Bowl advertising and Super Bowl activation to remind the American people of the cultural diversity of this incredible country. And I'm just going to play this 60 second ad to remind you all of what it really stood for. Now, the interesting thing about that commercial is it actually made Super Bowl history, not in 2014, even though it was the most discussed commercial in um, America in 2014, but it made history in 2016 when the good folk at the Coca-Cola company chose to run exactly the same execution again two years later. And it's the only Super Bowl in Super, Super Bowl ad in Super Bowl history that has aired in two different Super Bowls because the message still resonated. Excellent example of purpose-driven content. Now, who does it less well? Well, let's just stay in the soda category for a, a moment and talk about Coca-Cola's biggest competitor, and that's Pepsi. Pepsi have struggled to find an authentic voice that is relevant to Gen Z after the world called BS on its Black Lives Matter inspired commercial, which was quite rightly pulled after just 24 hours. Let's just take a look at this film. Wasn't done. Yeah, not on my watch. Took all my rights away. Telling me how to pray. Won't let us demonstrate. So a terrible attempt at trying to insert a brand into a cultural narrative and a cultural conversation that ultimately led to significant backlash. So <clears throat> the takeaways that I want you all to be clear on when you think about purpose-led. First of all, purpose just must be unifying and it must inform all decisions that you make as a company. 
Secondly, at all costs, avoid woke washing because it can lead to such detrimental consumer backlash. And thirdly, now more than ever before, yes, I want you to be bold in your beliefs, but I do want you to be sensitive to all stakeholders within your community. <clears throat> Brands have to play a role to make the world more harmonious and to make the more world more inclusive. So now let's just take a look at the second pillar, community driven. What are you doing to unlock the creative passion, the creative ideas, the storytelling that every single community that coalesces around a brand has the potential of producing? Well, I want to spend a moment just celebrating this brand who seems to have community management baked into everything that they do. Emily Wise, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Glossier, has built a community marketing engine. What started off as a blog is now a multi-billion dollar beauty empire. And Emily and her team use their community to help define the business, to help define the marketing strategy, to help define even the content. I mean, Boisturizer, Boy Brow, all of these products have been picked up, tested and promoted by Emily's community. And the Glossier marketing efficiencies make some of the more traditional beauty brands like L'Oreal, for example, seem so inefficient because L'Oreal hasn't yet figured out how to unlock the advocacy to the same intensity that Emily has done in um, her approach to building the Glossier empire. So brilliant work from Glossier, and I would encourage you all to spend some more time just studying how Glossier goes about building such rampant community engagement. And who gets community wrong? Who's done it wrong? Well, this might surprise you, but I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about Nike. Yes, Nike, one of the world's greatest brands and one of the world's most significant storytellers. And last year, Nike gave us a sensational epic ad called Dream Crazier. It really delivered an inspiring public narrative of female empowerment, um, but the Dream Crazier campaign was undermined significantly when female athletes that had, had previous relationships with Nike, again, called BS on Nike's support to them at a life-changing moment. So what happened? Well, many female athletes stood up and said, yes, Nike tells me to dream crazy unless I want to have a baby. And then Nike drops me. And this became a huge narrative of the disparity of female athletes and male athletes as far as their life relationship was concerned with Nike. Nike corrected this mistake. They changed their policy. Now Nike's female athletes get the same kind of long-term financial security as their male counterparts, regardless of whether or not they have babies. And the lesson that I want you to take from this session is when you are unlocking the creativity and the advocacy of your community, you must remember that it's about co-creation of value. It's not just about extracting value from your community. You can earn a much greater sense of loyalty if you think about the relationship beyond point of sale. And we're all human. It doesn't matter how successful, how iconic, how global the brand is, we can all make mistakes. And as Nike did, they lent in to this narrative, they apologized uh, for this narrative, and they corrected this narrative so that future female athletes will no longer suffer 
in the same way should they choose to have a family. So the third pillar, and thank you for sticking with me so far, the third pillar is about being tech enabled. How can we use technology not only to satisfy where our community is today, but to also lead our community, their expectations, their de desires, their hopes, lead them tomorrow through seamless technology that is designed with humanity at the heart of it. So build global scale, but make every single customer, consumer, or fan feel that this is a unique and bespoke product or brand for me. So let's take a look at who does this well. And I'm going to talk about another industry because the fashion industry has some incredible examples of brands that use technology well, but perhaps no greater example than Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix has leveraged the power of data to further enhance the experience of personal styling. So everybody can afford to have a personal stylist if you sign up with Stitch Fix. This has illuminated new ways to serve their communities and entirely new opportunities that have made them so much more than a clothing subscription brand. And Stitch Fix enjoys incredible loyalty for those customers who appreciate how Stitch Fix can help them anticipate the demands of their wardrobe. But who gets it wrong? Well, it seems that the entire fashion establishment seems to get technology wrong. Fashion retail icons from luxury to the mainstream are struggling to remain relevant to changing consumer needs regarding how they fill and maintain their wardrobes. And I'm a fashion junkie. I love these brands. And it breaks my heart when I see Neiman Marcus and Barney's and Macy's and JC Penney's struggling to maintain relevance because they haven't invested in the right kind of technology to get ahead of what consumers expect from their relationship with fashion retailers. So key takeaways from this pillar, avoid innovating just for the sake of innovating. Your innovation has to build closer and more personal relationships with each and every customer. Leverage data, of course, to drive scale, but also leverage data to drive deep personal emotional engagement. And draw your product focus and inspiration from whatever your higher order purpose is. That higher order purpose should set the technology roadmap for future growth. And finally, narrative-based. Everybody who works in a company should understand the story of that company and the company story should unify all members of the community. And when I say all members of the community, I mean investors, employees, policymakers, suppliers. Everybody should have the same story to share about a company. If you do that, then again, the marketing efficiencies that you get are that much greater because the story starts to take hold in the hearts and minds of existing and potential customers. So who does storytelling really, really well in terms of a completely co cohesive point of view? I have to point to Airbnb, don't I? Now, Airbnb, I'm very proud to say, became the world's first community-driven super brand. And it recognized all parts of the community from celebrities and investors and guests and hosts and 
and strategic partners and policymakers. And it created this narrative that each stakeholder could relate to and be inspired by through their own personal interaction. And I'm just going to share with you an example of an event that Airbnb held in Los Angeles in 2018, where over 20,000 people from 104 countries came to Airbnb's open because they wanted to participate in this immersive experience about the Airbnb story, which simply put, is the promise of a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Airbnb has created a we company, not a me company. We can get to know each other intimately and understand our collective narrative is a narrative for everyone and that we all can belong in a world together without borders. unveil today a 32-page magazine exclusively from the world of Airbnb. We think travel can be magical and easy. Welcome to the world of trips. Thank you so very much. I'm Jamie Foxx. I'm, I'm Jeremy Pivot. So phenomenal success for Airbnb because as a company, it is obsessive about a single narrative that binds so many different facets of their community together. And who gets it wrong? Well, this is before Dara joined Uber, but Uber's narrative three years ago, was so desperately fragmented. And the lack of an integrative, cohesive narrative ultimately cost the company tens of billions of dollars in total market cap as the public market investors started to question discrepancies in Uber's story. So what were those discrepancies? Well, if you were an investor five years ago at Uber, the promise was that this investment would create some of the biggest returns that the world had ever seen. And there was a genuine informed narrative that Uber would IPO at over $120 billion. However, if you were an employee at Uber, you were experiencing a culture of harassment, a culture of sexual harassment in certain cases. And so that experience became so detrimental in the face of this huge investor narrative. And if you were a driver at Uber, you were faced with a CEO who had declared that one day He'd get rid of all drivers and Uber would be a driverless proposition. And his engagement with drivers was disrespectful at best. So Uber had this fragmented narrative from investors and employees and policymakers and drivers. Now Uber's narrative is so much more cohesive and people are starting to feel that the Uber brand is so much less fragmented than it was before. Now, what do I want you to take away from narrative-based? I want you to craft a story so that every single stakeholder can see themselves. I want you to be very, very clear that um, every stakeholder has a clear role to play in the promotion of that story. And I also want you to appreciate that it's not just what you say in terms of your narrative, it's what you do. Because actions, particularly today, can speak so much louder than words. So it was by redefining 
these four pillars. The Airbnb went from this property rental company to an iconic, influential brand. And let's just take a look at some of the staggering stats of Airbnb's growth. In 2014, there were only 400,000 homes on the platform. Now there are 6 million. There are from, we went from 36 million nights booked to over 200 million nights booked. There were 18 unique guest check-ins in 2014, 2018, 70 million unique guest check-ins. And the valuation went from a billion dollars to $35 billion over a four-year period. But important to you all, the integrated marketing budget also grew significantly because we were constantly proving out the value of our return. And so what was a total integrated marketing budget of 25 million actually grew to a total integrated marketing budget of 500 million. So here's where I'd like you all to take out your cameras and take a shot of this screen because it's really a scorecard that we've developed that helps leaders and helps marketers really plot where they are in terms of their own strategic journeys towards excellence on all of these four pillars. And we literally just, as we kick off any client engagement, we hand out these cards and get the leadership team or the marketing team to independently score themselves one out of 10, one being terrible, 10 being world-class. And it is remarkable how quickly you start to see the discrepancies of leaders at the same company or leaders in the same discipline when they start to think strategically about these four pillars. So please use this, um, share it broadly. Uh, we think it's a really good way of having everybody rethink the role of brand and what you need to build so that you can become the world's most influential in your category. Okay, so that's all there is from me. Thank you very much for staying with me over this session. I am going to hang out in the chat so that we can kind of engage live. And if anybody wants to engage with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, it's simply at Mildenhall. Thank you once again for your time. I really do appreciate being part of this community.